Episode 196 of Futures Radio Show, sponsored by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world effectively manage risk. For access to free educational tools and resources for the active individual trader, please visit activetrader.cmegroup.com. Every day, traders and investors dive in to tackle the ever-changing markets to find opportunity. Futures Radio Show is your number one source for answers to the questions that all market participants want to ask. Veteran futures trader Anthony Crudelli sits down with the most influential leaders and top traders in the industry. Now, here's your host, Anthony Crudelli. Hey everyone, before we get started today, I want to thank our sponsors. CME Group, Trading Technologies, RJO Futures, and Top Step Trader. Now today I spoke with Art Hogan, Managing Director and Chief Market Strategist at B. Riley FBR. We kicked off today's conversation by Art telling us how he got his start in the financial industry. We then chatted about why the market has been more volatile this year versus last year, and will it remain volatile? We talked about yield curves, earnings, and economic data that traders should be watching for predicting what the Fed will be doing with interest rates. Finally, we chatted about the possible unwinding of the risk parity trade, a possible monetary policy mistake, tariffs, and trade wars. As usual, thank you all for listening, and please enjoy this episode. Art, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much for having me. It's great to have you on the show, Art. And I've been watching you on CNBC for decades, following your commentary, always giving great insight on the market. So it's great to have a chance to speak with you on the show today. Now, I know you've been in the industry for a long time. So I'm curious today, before we get started in some of the topics, can you tell us how you got your start in the financial industry? Yeah, absolutely. So I graduated uh, from the University of Vermont back in the early 80s and uh, Moved to Boston and got an entry-level job at Fidelity um, and uh, ran into some pretty smart guys that were able to move me up in my career pretty quickly. Moved from Fidelity to uh, Dean Witter, went through the Dean Witter-Morgan Stanley merger, ended up at Morgan Stanley and uh, spent a slug of time there uh, basically trading and trading the semiconductor pad. Um, needed to uh, get back to Boston because I had a wife that lived there and we're having a baby, so I took a job with Jeffries where I spent the next 12 years and been off to the races since then. So it's uh, starting at uh, the typical entry-level job at a company like Fidelity in a city like Boston was a great way to get my foot in the door. And then luckily was able to, uh, through some relationships and uh, working hard, work my way up to uh, a job at Morgan Stanley and Jeffries and then ending up here at uh, B. Riley FBR. So take us back to the days prior to you taking the job at Fidelity. What was the driving force behind your interest in the financial markets? Well, a couple of funny stories there. So I had a uh, Boy Scout leader whose name was uh, Bernie Weisberg. He was a broker for EF Hutton. He got me very interested in the market at a very early age. It's probably 10, 11, 12 years old. Started uh, buying a couple stocks of companies that I liked, like Kellogg's and some of the obvious things that were a big part of my life at that point in time. And actually learned how to do things like uh, growing up in Vermont, you're pretty close to the Canadian border. You can go around to little shops and tell them you're going to see an Expos game and see if they had any Canadian currency when it was trading north of a, a dollar at U.S. currency exchange and then take a fistful of dollars to the local bank and keep doing that over a course of a couple of days. You can make yourself five, ten bucks. So got into trading, got into watching stocks, all because I had a scoutmaster that was in the business and uh, worked for E.F. Hutton and kind of began there. And then the more I studied in school, you know, as far as economics went and political science, just I was fascinated with the banking industry and capital markets and how this country actually forms capital and gets companies uh, out into the public marketplace. So it's been a combination of having uh, some good leadership at a very early age and, and kind of have a knack for uh, wanting to make money and, and finding ways to make that happen. Yeah, I find it that a lot of the guests I speak to, myself included, that you either love this business and you passion it or you really don't like it because you really do have to have that full commitment to stay in it. And you've been around a long time. So, you know, obviously you love this business and, and I want to talk about current markets right now. Uh, you've been around a while. You've seen a lot. Last year was probably one of the lowest volatility years. I can remember my 20 plus years in the business. And then this year is one of the busier years. 
And you and I both know, Art, that the media is always going to f- conjure up ways as to why it's busy now. But as traders and you and I have been around, last year you could have said some of the same exact reasons uh, that the vol should have picked up, but it just didn't happen. So you're following these markets closely. What do you see right now are the top reasons that you believe volatility has picked up? And do you think that the markets are going to remain volatile? Yeah, I do. And I think that the difference year over year, and it's stunning, right? So when you think about the fact that in 2017, we only had eight 1% moves to the S&P 500, four of them up, four of them down. The market seemed to be able to ignore a lot of noise coming out of Washington, a lot of the chaos, the revolving door in the White House. Um, the, the market made an assumption that the Fed was going to be pretty gradual, and that played out. I think that the market, uh, you know, sort of looked at most of the news for the positive that it had. So we think about last year, we sort of had that ramp up with the, the promise of pro-growth, pro-business policy at the first part of the year. And then we saw a complete failure of repeal and replace of the Affordable Care Act, and then a quick pivot towards the end of the summer to getting tax reform done and the market just gradually accepted the fact that something was going to get accomplished. The more we saw evidence of that, the more the market celebrated. So we sort of had that November to the January peak um, blast off for the market. And I think in a nutshell, we had a market that was pretty, um, pretty agnostic to the rest of the noise, right? So 2017 rolls off, 2018 comes in. And the biggest changes I think is the market's not agnostic or not, um, Teflon or resilient to some of the noise that's happening. And then you layer on top of that a, a new Fed that's very straightforward in their language, right? There's no nonsense around Powell's commentary that they want to normalize rates and they want to normalize rates um, uh, in a pretty straightforward fashion. So they, they haven't wavered and talked about market conditions or volatility in the market or, you know, things that would have put perhaps a former Fed. Uh, decision off for a period of time. So when we think about the cycle, this is the first time we've had a straightforward speaking Fed chair that says they've got a roadmap and they're going to stick to it, regardless of what kind of volatility we're seeing in the market. I think that in and of itself has been one of the drivers. The fear is that we're going to have a Fed that pushes too fast, goes too far, regardless of what the pace of the economic data and the inputs are. And and more importantly, how much the curve is flattening, right? And that's one of the things I get concerned about. I'm ho- hoping that is something that they start talking about a bit more, that the, the two-year is, is, is going up faster than the yield on the 10-year, and that 210 spread flattening out is going to be one of the things that we're going to focus on quite a bit. The other thing at the very same time, so you've got this fear of a monetary policy mistake juxtaposed against a fear of a trade policy mistake. So both of those are relatively new to us. Remember, you know, we spent very little time talking about protectionism in the 2017. That's a relatively new topic. We heard about it in the campaign trail, but we didn't really move forward with any real measures towards protectionism. And then lo and behold, we get steel and aluminum tariffs. And then that's followed pretty quickly by $50 billion worth of goods that we're going to levy tariffs on from China. And that protectionism next to an aggressive Fed, or at least a, a steady Fed, um, has caused a great deal of, of volatility in the market situation. I think that's what's different. We didn't talk about protectionism to a great extent in 17, and we certainly didn't have a Fed, a new Fed chair that was as you know plain spoken and easy to understand and straightforward about the path to normalization in 2017. So I think that's those are the two biggest changes we've seen on a year-over-year basis. You mentioned a lot of things that I want to talk about right now, and one of those things I want to focus on first is the curve flattening. Now, I watched the 210 very closely. 75 basis points was something that Ira Harris pointed out to me, and I thought when that got broken, that was going to hurt equities. It, it didn't happen, and now the curve continues to get flat. What are you watching? You said that it was that was a concern of yours. What are you watching in the 210 or even the 530 as it gets flatter, that all of a sudden you feel that is going to have an impact on equities? Well, it's interesting. So the common refrain that you'll hear is that there's going to be a level at which the 10-year reaches that's going to be some red line in the sand that's bad for equities. And I think that's mis- that's misplaced. I think when we think about that, remember back in the February uh, time frame when we had the quick 10% sell-off, and that was due largely to the fact that we had a strong – uh, average hourly wage number in the January jobs report. And and uh, we broke through some resistance level on the yield on the 10-year. And everyone was talking about the 10-year getting to three and, you know, and that was going to be the death knell for equities. I think that was the wrong way to look at that. And, and you know, I think that we can easily live in a, you know, a three, 
three and a quarter yield on the 10 year um, and, and not be negative for equities. And, you know, the, the old argument is always, well, there's a level at which the yield or the safety trade uh, on the 10 year uh, would start attracting equity dollars and conversely slow down the economy with the cost of uh, doing business and the, and, the, and the cost of borrowing money. I think what's more concerning is the fact that our 10 year seems to be much more anchored to what global sovereigns are trading at. If you look at the European 10 years, obviously, you know, because of their their uh, current state of monetary policy, they're, they're yielding much lower. So, you know, we're, we're still finding that bid for it, our 10 year, which is keeping us anchored at a, something south of 3%. What gets concerning is we don't control the 10 year, but we are certainly having an effect on the two year and the two years affected a whole lot by our impression of monetary policy. So that's why the flattening is starting and it's increasing. Same thing is reflected in the LIBOR US dollar LIBOR rate, which is going up even faster than the two years. So whereas we control what's going on in the in the on the front end of the curve, we don't control what's going on in the belly of the curve. And and, uh, and that's where it gets concerning because there's so much leverage in the system right now that the tighter that gets, I don't think that a, a flattening yield curve is going to signal a recession. I think it may well cause that recession. Gotcha. Now, something else that you mentioned was how the Fed with Powell were in a new environment. And, and I completely agree with this. And I think that's what's different with the volatility this year versus last year is that we are now seeing a market trying to adapt to a tightening cycle. So when I had this conversation all, also with Peter Bookfar and Ira Harris, and we were all in agreement that th this has changed things. And the market is not used to bad news being bad news now. And I, I'm just curious uh, – about something that you said. You said that Q1 earnings can maybe shift the focus from DC back to the fundamentals. And call me crazy, but I don't know that I see uh, the earnings coming in, uh, better earnings coming in and saving this market right now. I think that this, this to me, the tape has changed. I think that the market's actually expecting good earnings because I hear more and more people talk about it. And I just think that we're going to see this that because we're in this tightening cycle, the markets probably remain bumpy, maybe even continue to go lower. But you said that that scenario with earnings could potentially focus from DC back to fundamentals. So talk to us about how you see that possibly happening. Well, it, and I only say that because it does, in reality, four times a year shift our focus from what is nothing but the macro to something that is other than the macro. And I only mean that for yeah. a short period of time, right? So for a period of three weeks, our focus in the market will be much more on a company by company or sector by sector basis, right? We'll start thinking about the fact that the industrials, you know, are probably trading at a pretty attractive multiple because they're starting to report and, and the multinationals have had the benefit in the first quarter of a weaker dollar. I think those types of conversations will be more the norm than the exception, at least for those three weeks that we actually report earnings. So that relief from the hyper focus that we have on Washington, on monetary policy, on trade policy, shifts to something more micro. Unfortunately, it only lasts for three weeks. So the entirety of my point there being that we have something else to talk about, something else to focus on, and it's not necessarily monetary policy. It is entirely you know, the makeup of the earnings for the S&P 500, at least for that three-week window that starts you know, now and, and, and proceeds for the next couple of weeks. I see. Yeah. And you know what? And I agree with that. You could already tell that that's happening. And we're recording on what, April 16th today. And you could feel that it has shifted a little bit. And I feel like that's the kind of market that we're in right now. It's going to shift in and out of moments. I think it's going to take a lot of adapting to do for traders because once that kind of fades, we go right back to, you know, we're in a tightening cycle and, and things change again. So uh, talking about the Fed, economic data, is something I watch. I don't trade it off it anymore. I think the algos have got that space. They've taken that from me. But I, I watch it because as a treasury and equities trader, I need to see what's going on in the economic data to see what the theme is going to be in the treasury market. And I also think that's going to impact on equities. So you watch this stuff very closely. What data points are you watching that you think may lean the Fed to potentially increase rates one, two, maybe even three more times this year, or actually maybe not raise rates much at all going forward. So I'm, I just want to pick your brain a little bit and talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing in the economic data. Well, it's interesting. So, you know, the, the, the Fed, I think, 
probably thinks about this in a longer term basis than we do. So you and I think about what they're going to do this year. They've raised rates once. Consensus is they'll raise rates two more times. Um, and the consensus, you know, around or the thought around a fourth increase this year has subsided a bit. If we look at the Fed funds futures, I think that that what the Fed is thinking is some, you know, sometime in the next two years, they'd like to raise five times. Right. And, and what has changed is when we look at the dot plot, the terminal rate or the, 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 the point at which they stop or, or consider to be, you know, in neutral is a touch higher than we thought it was a year ago. The other part of the conversation is what's a normal size balance sheet as they've gone as they start the balance sheet reduction process, and you know where does that go, right? So you know when we sort of went from 800 billion in round numbers to four trillion in round numbers, what do we go back to, and what's normal there? So the the things I think that drive some of those decisions, whereas you and I think about what's going to happen this year, I think the Fed's thinking about how many more times do we raise over the next 24 months, and I think in their mind. They've got a number of five, right? So whether we do three this year and two next year or two this year and three next year, that's, I think, what they're targeting. What changes that or what drives some of those decisions, first and foremost, is is the labor market and then any hints of inflation. I think the problem with the inflation side of that is that they measure the wrong things. I think the PCE, which is what they look at, doesn't really encompass where the inflation is coming from or measure properly where inflation is coming from or they would have started normalizing more than they already have earlier. I think if you, they've been looking at core CPI uh, on a year over year basis, that's much closer to what they should be measuring in real terms. So it's, a, it's you know, there is that, that argument around, are we measuring the right things for inflation? So the things outside of that, that I focus on that probably drive those things, obviously is how tight the labor market is and, and are we seeing an increase in, in uh, participation in the labor market? Are we seeing a, a pickup at all? in um, average hours, hours worked and average hours, average hourly earnings. And then how much of a transition are we seeing from part-time workers to full-time workers? So I think that, you know, a, a lot of the inputs that I think about are around the labor uh, reports that we get, but as it pertains to any wage price pressure we might start to see, because that's the right kind of inflation we'd like to see to drive those decisions. Gotcha. So basically you think the Fed is going to try as hard as they can to stick to five over the next couple of years and what traders and investors should be focusing on are the labor numbers. And as long as they stay somewhat in line with what we've been seeing, they're going to stick to that. They're, they're, that's the only thing you could see that would possibly derail that five. Well, I think, you know, the, the, the other thing that's going to derail the five, and you're going to start to hear this more in the conversation around the Fed, is they're going to be cognizant of what's going on in the yield curve, right? And knowing that they're affecting the two-year um, and knowing that three years is, is 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 anchored to things outside of our control, I think that's going to be part of the conversation. They're not going to want to flatten the yield curve. And I think that there's going to be two possible outcomes that, that change that. So first and foremost, our treasury obviously has a massive need for new issuance, right? So we've got a much larger debt that we need to pay for, and that means we're going to see monthly auctions. Right now, the focus of those auctions have been entirely at the front end of the curve because it's cheaper, right? And, you know, if I'm running the treasury, I would, I would logically focus on that. But if, in fact, I was running the treasury and focusing on what is happening to the yield curve by folk, by you know having so much in the front end and not enough in the belly in terms of issuance, I'd probably shift that. I'd probably make a shift in real time and issue more at the 10-year level that would naturally sort of put an upward bias to the yield on the 10-year and perhaps you know broaden out that curve. At the same time, if I saw as the head of the Fed or if I was a voting member or part of that discussion around that table and, and noticed the tightening that we're seeing, I would I would ratchet back the pace at which I was starting to raise rates, knowing full well that both LIBOR and the, the, the two-year or the front end of the curve is being affected much more than the 10-year can move up. So I think a combination of those two things might be something we're talking about six months from now. I think you and I may have a conversation you know, in a couple of quarters and say, oh, this is how we adjusted for that and, and uh, we're able to not flatten the curve as much as we're seeing right now. What that brings to my mind is the risk parity trade. If rates continue to go higher and equities start to stumble again and we see a situation where you know, bonds and treasuries are going down with equities, I think that could be really an interesting time. Do you fear the risk parity trade unwinding oh, a bit? I certainly did in February, you know, and I think we all did, right? So it's, it's you know, to me, it's that, you know, that's the, uh, that's the $64,000 question. How does the market react to that? And where is, you know, where are those pain points with which that starts to be a, you know, a negative 
for the equity markets. But I will tell you, it's hard to it's hard to imagine that we're in an economy that couldn't handle a three and a quarter or a three and a half yield over the next 24 months on the 10 year and still have, you know, the S&P 500 trading at, you know, 16 and a half or 17 times forward earnings. And that's those are the things that I like to juxtapose when I sort of think about this is, you know, does does the, you know, the 10 year being in a range this year, let's call it two, two and three quarters to three and a quarter adversely affect people's decisions to look at equities that are trading at, you know, call it 17 times, um, you know, currently at the levels we're at today. And and so I, I'm not sure that that, that you know, that's going to be the sort of doomsday prophecy that happened when you have that, you know, scenario playing out in real time. We'll see what happens. But I just yeah. think that the, the February 10 percent downdraft with a lot of the things that you're talking about coming into play in a quick period of time was much more about the velocity of the move that we saw. We broke out of that sort of three-year range, 266 got taken out. We all assumed that the yield on a 10-year was going to blast through 3% and land somewhere at three and a quarter, and it was all going to happen in two weeks. I think it was the pace of the increase in the yield on a 10-year with thoughts of hyperinflation all of a sudden because one month the report on the jobs number came in hot for what was probably a lot of uh, weather-related reasons. Um, in the near term, I think that, you know, we've backed that back down. We've seen the, 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 the latest of the jobs reports and that, you know, that increase in average hourly earnings is, is at the same pace that we've seen for the last couple of months. Yeah, no, you make a great point. Speed trumps reasoning because when rates are starting to go up very fast and you start to see equities come down a little bit, the, the, the fear of not knowing how fast much further rates are going to go up and how much further equities are going to go down is always the fear. That's why you see those situations happen. But what you're basically saying is, as you sit back and read the tea leaves, the fundamentals of the stock market are strong enough to handle three, three and a quarter, 10 year, and, and the yield curve as flat as it is right now, it's strong enough to handle that. So if the market does get beaten down, you don't think that we're going to go into this you know, major sell off in the market just because of that. No, I don't. You know, and and you know, we 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 keep hearing that, which is which is puzzling to me. You know, the last time I was concerned about what the yield on a ten year was that that's going to disrupt markets. It had a four handle, not a three handle. The problem is we've lived in such a low interest rate environment for such a long time that we've got this muscle memory that thinks the new round number is the new you know line in the sand. We saw some hints of that in February, but I think it was much more of an overreaction to the pace at which we got there than it was the actual number. And I think you'll find that, let's say for the next you know, the balance of this year, we're two and three quarters, three and a quarter range on the 10 year. I don't think that disrupts the apple cart whatsoever, especially if we, if with that move, we see a uh, steepening in the yield curve at all. Something else you said at the beginning, you said monetary policy, should we fear a policy mistake? I believe that's what you said. Talk to us a little yeah. bit more about that. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I think you and I both know historically what stops bull markets and it's recessions and 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 four times out of five a recession is going to be because of a policy mistake and i think a policy mistake can be tightening too much at the wrong time right tightening into you know what could be an economy that's slowing down tightening too rapidly and flattening a yield curve just making a mistake on monetary policy tends to be one of the most common ways that you can roll over a what is otherwise a bull market and i certainly think that uh you know the other reasons for you know, recessions sort of live in the, you know, policy mistake that's something around starting wars, right? Uh, you know, going to war, you know, and escalating a geopolitical conflict into a war where we have to spend a lot of money where there's no recourse for that. So my fear of a policy mistake lies in that flattening of the yield curve, uh, agnostic to what's going on around, Look, not looking at financial conditions, not looking at how much you were perhaps flattening the yield curve in the process of getting normalization. And the other part of this, you know, entire quandary around monetary policy is, you know, at what pace do you let that balance sheet roll off? Are those, uh, you know, those assets that mature and roll off is an experiment on the way in, and it's going to be a larger experiment on the way out. So all of those things sort of play into that. This is a very difficult needle to thread for the Fed right now. And you've got some, you know, sort of new voters and a new chair that hasn't necessarily been tested yet, right? So to me, I think that's where the fear comes from. It comes from a historic backdrop of knowing that the Fed is, has, you know, caused recessions before by having a monetary policy mistake. And we've got a new Fed that uh, we're not sure exactly how they're going to react to changes in, the, in data and inputs. What is the one sign that you watch that would indicate a recession is imminent? 
if it, the yield curve flattens any more than we're seeing now, if we got you know inside of let's let's talk about at fifty basis points now, if that if that gets cut in half, that's going to be too close to uh, tipping it over, and, and with the amount of leverage that's in the global system, and you know where. LIBOR would probably be at that point in time. That means we've pressed too hard on the short end of the curve, and and that's going to cause in and of itself its own damage. So I keep a close eye on the on the two tens or whatever your preferred um, ratio is to see what those spreads are doing because that gets dangerous. We've gone through this period where you know we've contracted and expanded back out, but we sort of seem to be sitting in that sort of forty five to seventy five basis point spread. I think when if that compressed more than that. I think that would be the line in the sand that we'd be crossing. It would be difficult for us to go back. I want to talk a little bit about tariffs, trade wars. <laughs> I mean, if we've learned nothing from Trump, that his initial tweet is always the overreaction. We saw markets overreact. I was sitting here at my screens watching these tweets come out and just going, okay, nothing set in stone yet. This is what he does. How do you see – if at all, tariffs and trade wars impacting markets going forward. So I can tell you this: the you know you, I think you you framed it up perfectly, right? So the protectionism, full stop, is is a bad idea. It doesn't promote economic growth. I think using trade as a as a policy to get economic growth, trade policies to promote economic growth, is folly from the beginning, right? I think that if we look at trade deficits or or trade good deficits, it's a ridiculous way to measure whether or not we're doing well overall, right? So since the since the, the the basic assumptions that are being made in trade policy are flawed to begin with, it's difficult to see a positive outcome. But I agree with you in terms of how we're applying this process, right? So the art of the deal, right? We've got the the you know the president that's got his preferred way of operating, which is threaten the worst and then back up and find some middle ground. We found that with steel and aluminum tariffs right away. We had you know, a week over week change from this is going against everybody in the world to, hey, we're going to carve out Canada, Mexico, very good idea, uh, Brazil, the EU, Australia. So all very good ideas, but that was that middle ground. So we started with the, with the harshest announcement, then we tried to find some middle ground, hoping that we're getting to that same place in China, right? We're going to start off with $50 billion worth of goods, and then China is going to respond in, in, in kind. And then, you know, we're going to hint that maybe we're going to find another hundred billion dollars worth of goods, just, you know, trying to play a little more hardball and then some reconciliation or, or at least some softer commentary in the backdrop, hoping that both parties are going to get to a table and negotiate something that's more favorable for both. And, and hopefully a place where we can get to, you know, walk away and have both sides declare some sort of victory here. So to me, I think that the, the, the signpost that will say that we're being effective in that is if we can actually renegotiate NAFTA. I think NAFTA is probably as important as anything we're doing with China right now, two of our more important trade partners. If we can get to a point where this administration gets to an agreement on NAFTA, I think that will show the markets that we're able to have the flexibility to negotiate and we'll and probably be able to do the same thing with China. We're not there yet, unfortunately, but I think that's going to be the sign. So if you're looking for a sign that this is working, and we're starting to hear some positive commentary. If you look at the Mexican peso, I think that's manifesting an opinion that perhaps we're getting closer to settling this NAFTA negotiation. I think that's going to go a long way to calming markets down that we're not going to have that trade policy mistake. We're not going to tweet our way into a trade war, which is going to be negative for everybody. Last question before we get into rapid fire. <laughs> we talked a lot about the Fed today, a lot of things that traders and investors should be watching. Where do you stand? Do you think the Fed is going to do one or two more this year? Do uh, you think they're going to get their five over the next year and a half to two years? No, I, I, unfortunately, I, I, I don't know that the economy and the financial conditions are going to keep up with their, their wants and needs at that pace. So I wouldn't be surprised if we are, you know, we, we see one more increase this year, unless and until we see the, the yield curve, you know, sort of um, steepen a bit. Um, but I think I wouldn't be surprised if we got to four over the next 24 months with, you know, two happening this year and two happening next year. I just don't know that this market and this economy is going to be able to sustain, you know, sort of a three a year or a three this year and two next year kind of pace. So I think we're at a point in time where they're still feeling things out. And I only say that because at the same time, you've got the, uh, the effect of, of quantitative tightening happening as we let some of the assets on that balance sheet roll off. So the order of magnitude that you know of both of those things happening at the same time probably put the the interest rate increases 
um, on the back burner while they continue to sort of moder- moderate what's going on or modulate what's going on on the balance sheet. Excellent insight today, Art, but we're not done yet. I have some rapid fire questions if you're ready for those. Uh, absolutely. All right, everyone. Our rapid fire segment is sponsored by Trading Technologies. You can access the global markets from virtually anywhere with TT. They are the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. And now you can trade cryptocurrency spot and derivative markets side by side. For more information, please visit tradingtechnologies.com. Art, first question. What trader has influenced your life the most and why? So two come to mind. Both their names are Dave. Oddly enough, one's Dave Heron. Gave me one of my first jobs actually trading. He was a specialist on the floor of the Boston Stock Exchange. He can remember about a million things and know where he bought and sold things years ago. He knew where key levels were. He was the first person to introdu- introduce me to technical analysis. I remember some of the lessons I learned from him and, and Will for the rest of my life. The other name is Dave LaLiberté, works for Fidelity and then at Vanek Asset Management, one of the most amazing natural senses for market movement and a dear friend of mine. So both both Dave's and both excellent traders. What was one of the hardest things that you've had to overcome in trading? Uh Taking losses and taking losses faster. I think that one of the hardest things you can do is 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 to go with your gut and get out of a bad position. Not letting a trade turn into an investment. Not averaging down. And you know, whenever I've sort of you know been in that position, the hardest lesson to learn is that first loss is going to be your best loss. And 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 that took me a while to to figure out. But uh, once you do, it, it's 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 a psychological relief once you get that beyond you. Just get out of this one. There was a mistake. Move on. There's other trades to make. How has your trading evolved over the years? Well, I tell you this, you know, when I first started trading, it was very much of a scalping business and, and the spreads were ace and quarter, so it was much easier to do. You can't trade that way anymore, unfortunately, since we've gone to decimalization, so it, it involves much more patience when you sort of think about things and you have to have a sterner constitution and you have to be right about some trends. And unfortunately, this year, the trends only last for about 24 hours. What's your favorite book about trading or the markets? Bonfire of the Vanities comes to mind. One of the first ones I read, it, it was both insightful about the, the goings-on in Wall Street and uh, a nice historical backdrop and an easy read, and I'd recommend it to anybody. What's your favorite movie or TV show about trading or the markets? Well, I'm kind of torn there. Trading Places or Wall Street, it's your pick. Depends on which one that uh, happens to be on when you're, uh, when you're turning the TV on. Both have a clear insight into what goes on in the marketplace. Oddly pretty realistic and, uh, and something that has test, lasted the test of time. What's the best piece of advice that you've received about trading or the markets? Best advice that I've received about trading or the markets is the market is always going to be bigger than you and the market doesn't get anything wrong. So understand that you're never going to be bigger than the market and let it dictate your moves. Don't try to dictate its moves. Now, if you could give a piece of advice to the new people interested in getting involved in trading, what would it be? Study as much as you can. Try to find a mentor who's willing to spend some time with you because there's nothing to replace experience. No matter what you read or how many journals you go through or try to watch the tape yourself, the best experience you can get as a young trader is to find an old trader and talk to him as much as you as he's willing to do. Last question for today. If you weren't involved with trading in the markets, you'd be doing what? I'd be probably running a hardware store that I could turn into a comedy club at night. I love hardware stores, and I love to own my own business. And then upstairs in the attic, we'd serve some beer, and I could uh, do a little comedy. I love that. Uh, Art, where can people find you on Twitter? And give us a website to check out. So if you look on Twitter, it's just my name, Arthur Hogan, with uh, three capital letter I. So Arthur Hogan the third on Twitter. And, uh, and our website is uh, brileyfbr.com. Art, thank you so much for taking the time to come on Futures Radio Show today. I really enjoyed speaking with you. Anthony, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you have any questions or comments for myself or my guests, please visit futuresradioshow.com and sign up to be a premium member for free. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes.